So, um, welcome to our session. Today, we will talk about unique vulnerabilities we discovered in the implementation of PostgreSQL as a managed service across multiple cloud providers. Uh, during the session, we will go into the technical details of the vulnerabilities, how we were able to exploit certain modifications in the PostgreSQL in order to get a privilege escalation, and also cross-tenant access to other databases of other customers. Um, I hope that after this session, you will have much better understanding of how managed services work in general in the cloud, also about uh, our open source project that was written 25 years ago, was integrated into a managed service and offered to a lot of customers, some PostgreSQL internals, because it's always fun to go into the internals, and uh, how we, as the Wiz research team, conduct our uh, research. Uh, just a fun fact, uh, all the elephants you see on the screen are actually AI generated, uh, which is uh, pretty cool. You will see those along the session. So let's start with a bit about us. Uh, my name is Shir, Shir Tamari, and I'm Nir Ochfeld, and uh, both of us from the Wiz research team. Uh, we try to bring groundbreaking new research into the cloud uh, industry. We would like to uh, uncover and find new risks, uh, both for uh, protecting our customers, but also to share with the community and present it here on that stage. Um, we had some notable uh, research, like uh, Oh My God, Chaos DB, also Extra Replica, which we are going to talk about today. And um, yeah, so Nir, would you like to tell us what is the agenda for today? <laughs> Thank you, Shil. So, in today's agenda, we'll first off begin with some motivation. What actually led us to research the implement implementation of PostgreSQL across multiple cloud vendors? We'll then dive into two implementation vulnerabilities that, was, that were caused by the modifications that cloud vendors introduced to the PostgreSQL engine. And we we'll also show how we managed to leverage these kind of vulnerabilities to gain an unauthorized access to the databases of other customers using the service. And we'll finish things off with some takeaways. So, our story begins in last year's Black Hat Europe, where my colleague Sagi and I presented on stage ChaosDB. We showed that how, almost by accident, by, by ex exploiting a chain of vulnerabilities, we were able to gain an unauthorized access to the database instances of other customers using one of Azure's flagship database solutions, Cosmos DB. So, the day of our talk, we were sitting in our hotel lobby, thinking, could it be that Chaos DB is not an isolated case, and that there are more cloud services that may be vulnerable to the similar kind of attacks? <laughs> so essentially, the same day of our Black Hat talk, we were already looking for our next target. So, Cosmos DB was a managed service that, that gave us the ability to execute code on a shared environment. So we wanted to find a similar uh, service, a, ser a managed service that actually lets us to execute code in a shared environment. A shared environment is an environment managed by the cloud vendor that actually hosts the instances of multiple customers. During our research, we found that this is where cloud vendors struggle the most in keeping the customer's instances completely isolated for one another. And we wanted to be a database as a service. Databases are one of the most integral parts in any organization, making them the attacker's holy grail. In the end of the day, almost every network operation's goal is to get to the database. So we thought that if we manage to find another vulnerability in a database as a service, it sure would have a lot of impact. So, we are looking for a database as a service that has the ability to execute code in the form of a feature. And after a good few hours of scouting for this kind of a service, we were pretty much left empty-handed. Apparently, Cosmos DB was kind of a special snowflake in the, its direct ability to actually execute code in a shared environment. But then we thought that all of these databases as services are actually based on open source database solutions. And one of these database solutions must have a feature that will actually let us to execute code in a kind of straightforward way. And apparently, PostgreSQL, one of the internet's most popular database engines, a database agent that is being used across all major cloud providers. 
actually has a very straightforward way of executing code via SQL. You can execute the following SQL query, which starts with creating a table that stores the command's output, executing the command via the copy statement. In this case, we are executing the ID command that shows the privileges of the currently running user, and then we'll query the command's result. And executing this command, should yield, this query should yield us something that looks like this. So the next thing we did is to take this exact SQL query and execute it against every managed Postgres SQL available on the market, hoping that at least one of them forgot about this little trick. But unfortunately, without any exception, they all gave us the same error message, stating that we are simply lacking the privileges to use the copy statement, and that in order to use the copy statement, we'll need to be a super user. But I mean, the Postgres SQL privilege model shouldn't be the thing that stops us from executing code. I mean, this is not a real security barrier. How hard could it be to actually manage to find a vulnerability that will allow us to elevate our privileges to a super user and thus gain the ability to execute commands and then get an inside look to the service internal workings? And to answer this very question, I would like to invite Shir back to stage to walk you through some very cool vulnerabilities. Thanks. Okay, so we, had, we took this snippet, we ran it across a lot of cloud providers, a lot of managed Postgres SQL services, and one of them was GCP, the Google Cloud Compute, and specifically, the Cloud SQL service. The Cloud SQL provides customers with multiple uh, open sources, databases, offerings, um, and we created a Postgres SQL instance, we connect it, and we try to execute code with no success. So the first thing we did is we try to understand who are we? What permissions do we have over the database? So we can see that we are running as the user Postgres. And the user Postgres is a member of the Cloud SQL super user role. And it doesn't seem like we have special permissions. We are definitely low privileged user with no permissions. And another user we have in the database is the Cloud SQL admin. This is actually an administrator, a super user within the database um, used by Google to manage this uh, instance, and we don't have any access to it. So we don't have permissions to execute code, and we are not real super users, but apparently we can create event triggers. Now, event triggers is not necessarily um, a dangerous operation in Postgres. You just create an event trigger. The thing about event triggers is that only super users can create event triggers. This is from, this screenshot is from the official Postgres SQL documentation. Now this is weird because we don't have permissions in the database, we are not super users, but yet we can create event triggers. What's going on here? And it's not just event triggers, it's also loading extensions. In Postgres SQL, you must be a super user in order to load most extensions. And here we have a case where we can actually load extensions. This is also weird. Something else we noticed is that we can create a table and change the owner of the table to another user, to just give it to another user in the database, uh, even users which are not associated with our role. And this is also very not default behavior. I mean, here I have a screenshot. We can create a table. Let's call it test table. Owned by the user Postgres, we can actually change the owner to the Cloud SQL admin, which we are not associated with. And this is not default behavior. So this made us believe that the Postgres SQL engine was modified. Later, we actually discovered that Google publicly announced this. They shared this in their documentation. They say that you cannot create database users that have super user privileges. However, you can create database users with the Cloud SQL super user role, which has some super user privileges, including creating extensions, creating event triggers, creating replication users. So now we know that the Postgres SQL engine was modified, um, and we are not really a super user, but also we are not regular user, because we have some super user capabilities. That brought us to raise a very interesting research question. Can we use those capabilities, those unique capabilities that Google offered us, in order to break the Postgres SQL security model and use those into to elevate our privileges. So we were exploring those functionalities, 
And the ones that caught our eyes was the option to alter a table and change the owner of the table to another user. Basically, in Postgres, if we create a table and we try to change the owner to a user we are not associated with, we should receive the following error message, that we must be a member of the role Cloud SQL Admin in this case. But in Google, it actually worked. We managed to create a table and to change the owner to the Cloud SQL Admin. Now, in order to understand like, how impactful this capability could be, we will do a very short recap of two very basic uh, things in Postgres, tables and indexes. Imagine we have a table called employees table. We have the three records, Sheer, Near, and Bill. And the table is indexed by the ID column. Whenever, we insert a new, whenever a user insert a new item to the table, the table has a new item. Now, Postgres supports indexes, like any relational database, but also it supports index functions, which means we can create an index on a certain column, and that whenever we insert something to the table, it will be indexed based on the output of a certain function. So every time a user inserts something to the table, the index function behind the scene, the one we declared, will be executed, and the uh, new row in the, in the table will be indexed based on the output of that function. So what is the potential risk here? We have the us a user who perform insert or update, and it's not just insert and update. There is a lot of uh, commands that actually execute uh, index functions, like analyze and vacuum. If a user performs this operation on a table, behind the scenes, an index function is going to be invoked. And it's not just our user. If Bill will perform an operation on a table owned by me, by the user Postgres, they will also invoke the index function. And the same goes for super users who perform operation on our table. Now, Postgres wanted to face this potential security risk, and they wanted to avoid a situation where users accidentally invoke functions they don't know about. So they added a mitigation for these exact issues 13 years ago. They decided that whenever a user performs an operation on a table, the index function behind the scene will be executed with the permissions of the table owner. So if a super user is performing insert on the table, the index function will still be called with the permissions of the user Postgres because the user Postgres are the one on the table. Now here maybe some of you already have an idea of uh, how this uh, behavior is going to be exploited. What would happen if we've, we create a table and then change the owner of the table to Cloud SQL Admin? We will create a table with an index function and then we will change the owner because Google allow us to do so. In that case, if the table will be owned by the Cloud SQL Admin, the super user, every time someone will perform an operation on the table, like insert or update, the index function, which we declared, will be executed with the Cloud SQL Admin permissions. All we have to do now is just to replace the index function with an evil function, and let's say we will craft an evil function with the following code, that execute the ID command. After performing an operation on the table, it could be insert, update, analyze, vacuum, we will get the following results. We will actually able to execute code on the Postgres SQL instance of Google. This is the output of the ID command. At that part of the research, we were very excited. We were able to gain a code execution on a managed instance on the, on managed by Google and we were very excited to explore the internal environment of the managed service. We know that we are current, car probably running inside an internal network, uh, like a shared environment, and we execute code uh, with the permission of the modified process SQL instance. So we start doing some recon, and we discover that we are running inside a Docker container, and the Docker container is probably running inside a virtual machine. We also notice that we have an, a in network interface shared with the host, it was a um, shared namespace, uh, with the 10.128 uh, subnet. We were able to find privilege escalation vulnerability in order to gain root access within the Docker container. Then we used the root access in order to escape the container and get the root access to the virtual machine. From there, we were able to see the control plane, the components that manage our service, and also other a process SQL instances that were accessible through the local network. 
Later, we discovered that those are actually our own instances. Because we choose the high availability feature in uh, Postgres, we got some replications, and this is actually um, replica replications of our own database. At that moment of the research, we received a very surprising email from Google. <laughs> they sent us an email uh, on a very old disclosure thread we had with them regarding another vulnerability. And they said, like, hey there, wanted to ask, in case it was you or one of your colleagues, have you folks, have you folks doing uh, research on Cloud SQL? Would you mind sharing your progress if so? Now, that was the first time, I mean, we do a lot of cloud research. That was the first time we got caught. Um, so we wrapped everything up, we wrote a very detailed report, and uh, we shared it with our, our friends at Google. And at that point, we were very excited about our finding, and we knew that probably there is a lot of other vendors we can go and check if they did similar modifications, maybe we can find similar vulnerabilities. So that brings us for the next example, the Azure Postgres SQL Flexible Server. Because also Azure provide managed Postgres, and maybe they do, they did the same things. So first thing, we felt lucky. We were just logging to the Azure Postgres SQL instance and trying to execute code the straightforward way. And same way as we had with Google, we had here, we must be a super user or a member of the PG Execute server program in order to execute code. So same as we did with Google, same as we do here, we check. Which permissions do we have? So we are running as the user Postgres, and we are a member of the Azure PG admin, which is an Azure unique role. It doesn't seem like we have a lot of permissions. We do have some roles, but they're not that interesting. And we don't have permissions to execute code. But we do have some privileged capabilities, like creating event triggers. Um, in addition, we also have the option to create a checkpoints. Not risky operation, but according to the documentation, you need to be a super user in order to create checkpoints. And same as with Google, we can also load extensions. So probably they modified the Postgres SQL, just the same as Google did. And it's actually it's pretty astonishing. Two vendors, two different code bases, all wanted to introduce the same capabilities. But in Azure, something else caught our eyes. They provide us the create role permission. Now, create role permission is actually pretty popular among um, uh, cloud-managed uh, services. Um, they tend to uh, provide this, uh, uh, this uh, capability or this permission. Uh, but all of, everyone, every time you do that, you must strict it because this is a very powerful permission. According to the Postgres SQL documentation, you must be careful with the create role privilege. It's a role, uh, if a role does not have a certain privilege, but is allowed to create other roles, it can easily create another role with different privileges than its own. And therefore, regard roles that have create role privilege as almost super users, almost super user roles. So we know that we can create, we, I mean, we don't know yet, but we believe that we can create new users and specify unique roles. Which roles can we provide a new user in Postgres? So here is the list of the most powerful roles we can provide it. We can provide it with PG read server files, which will allow us to read files from the file system. Pretty, pretty powerful. Also, we can specify the PG write server files, which will allow us to write files to the file system. But last, the most powerful permission, or the most powerful role, PG execute server program, which will allow us to execute code if we will have this permission. So next thing we did, we created a new user. We called it James. And we specify all the three privileges. Read server files, write server files, and execute server program. And it worked. We actually were able to create a new user. And now we have a user called James with those very powerful permissions. So next thing we did, we logged in as the user James and we execute the following SQL query. Now here, we, we didn't want to, I mean, we didn't even execute the ID command. Straightforward for a reverse shell. And it worked. We're actually getting, yeah, we can. <laughs> we were able to get a reverse shell to our Azure managed instance and same as with Google, we were very excited. We have a new environment to recon, to research, to understand where are we, 
what can we do from there, and what is the possibilities um, we can actually achieve with this vulnerability. Um, this is the time to invite Neil to stage to go over the extra replica vulnerability and how we gain cross-tenant access to the databases of other customers. Thank you, Shil. So as Shil mentioned, I'm going to show you how we were able to leverage these kind of vulnerabilities to gain an unauthorized access to the databases of other customers using the service. So this is where we began. We know that we are running inside of, inside of some sort of an Azure modified version of Postgres SQL. And after doing some basic recon, we realized that we are actually running inside of a dedicated Docker container, and that this de de dedicated Docker container actually runs on top of a dedicated virtual machine. Next, we executed the if config command to see which network interfaces that do we have. This is where we learned that our virtual machine is actually a part of two subnets. And this made us assume that we are actually a part of some sort of an Azure internal network. But we still don't know what are these network subnets. So to try to answer this question, we actually used the nmap port scanning tool to try to map the host within the Azure internal network. And this command essentially checks if there are other Postgres SQL instances within that network. And as it turns out, within the Azure internal network, there were other 212 database instances, meaning hosts that we can connect to through the Postgres SQL default port, port 5432. Now, at this point we wondered, are these our instances the same way it was in GCP? So we really hope not. First of all, we wanted to prove cross-tenant access, and we were really hoping that we are not paying for 212 Postgres instances, <laughs> because in the cloud you can never know. So we have a direct connection to other customer databases, but we like to, the appropriate credentials to actually do any meaningful actions. So the next thing we did is something that we do in almost every, almost every cross tenant research, and is to examine the default configuration coming with the virtual machine image. Being a managed service, this means that all of the instances are running the same image with the same configuration. This means that if we'll be able to find an exploitable misconfiguration, it, it is applicable to other customer instances. So we examined the Postgres SQL authentication configuration files. We first examined the PGHBA conf, which is the Postgres SQL authentication configuration file. This file dictates who can connect to which database. And we also examined the PGIDENT file. The PGIDENT file is essentially an extension to the PGHBA file detailing further configuration for more advanced authentication mechanisms, authentication mechanisms that are a bit more advanced than the usual user password authentication. So here's a short snippet of the PGHBA file we found on our machine. And we noticed that this file is very different from the default one coming with Postgres. Postgres. And what actually caught our eyes are the three last lines. So to understand why, let's parse it together. So essentially, these three lines say that in order to authenticate to the replication database, we need to authenticate as the replication user. And we can only do that through a set of internal subnets. One of them is the 10.0.0 subnet we've seen before. And the authentication mechanism for that user is client certificate authentication. This means that if we want to authenticate to the replication database, for another Postgres SQL instance within the Azure internal network, we need to supply some sort of a valid certificate. But how does a valid certificate even look like? This is exactly where the pgident file comes into play. The pgident file has two regular expressions that are being used in order to validate the certificate subject name. You may notice that both of the regular expression actually contains some sort of, some sort of a unique identifier. This is actually the host name of the virtual machine hosting the Postgres SQL instance. And this, uh, this is a unique identifier for each instance, meaning the regular expression actually varies from, the, from instance to instance. And there isn't just one certificate that can be used to authenticate to all instances. Rather, a new certificate needs to be issued for every new instance. OK, so we'll begin with the second regular expression, because it's a bit more easier. So essentially, 
If we supply a certificate that begins with RL, which I can only uh, assume it stands for replication, the unique identifier of the database, pod, AOSDB, azclimb.ms, we can authenticate to the replication user. Now, because only Microsoft is the owner of the azclimb.ms domain, they're the only ones who can issue this certificate. Okay, seems pretty straightforward. But things get a bit more complicated when it comes to the first regular expression, because it actually utilizes regular expression matching groups. This means that the identity of the user we are authenticating to is determined by the prefix of the subject name. This means that if we supply a certificate that has the prefix of replication, we can authenticate to the replication user. Same goes with if we supply the prefix near, we can authenticate to the user near, shear, so on, and so forth. But now, maybe some eagled eye spectators in, in the audience may notice that this regular expression is a bit over-permissive, because it actually ends with a wildcard. This is quite an easy misconfiguration that we can exploit. This means that while we are not the owner of the Azure.com domain, and thus we cannot issue this certificate, we can actually take the entire subject name of the domain we want to authenticate to and register it under a domain of our control, in this case, wizresearch.com. This subject name will be also validated by this regular expression and will actually let us to authenticate to the database. So if we examine the PGHBA file one more time, in order to authenticate to the replication user, we need to have an IP address in the 10.0.0 subnet, which we have, and we need to supply a valid certificate, which we can. So the next thing we did is to actually try to authenticate to that database. And to our surprise, we got the following error message, stating that the replication database simply does not exist. But it does not make any sense. Why would Azure have a specific configuration for a database that is not there? So apparently, the replication database is not a real database. It's a pseudo database. And connecting to this database actually lets you to replicate the entire PostgreSQL instance, and not just a specific database. And we can do that by using one of the built-in PostgreSQL uh, utilities called PG Base Backup. So we have everything that we need in order to start replicating databases. Now, in every other <laughs> presentation, this is the point I will show you a live demo of the vulnerability. But being a cloud vulnerability, this vulnerability is now patched, so I cannot show you a live demo. But I'll try to do my best in illustrating the entire attack flow using the magic of illustration and animation. So we have on our left our, uh, research, uh, our research machine. And on the right, we have our victim, which is, uh, and we want to get its confidential information. The victim has the following host, host name, begins with BA. So the next thing what we'll do is issue a certificate that will actually let us to authenticate to the replication user on that database. As you can see, we have a subject name that begins with replication, followed by the unique identifier of the database, and it all sits under the wizresearch.com domain. Next, we use the PG based backup utility, uh, feeding it with our newly issued certificate, and connect to the replication user. After doing that, the our host machine will actually send the SSL certificate and authenticate to the database, and we'll get a full replication of the database with its entire confidential information. So we sent our report to Microsoft, and they addressed the issues amazingly fast. Only 48 hours after an initial report, the, the, the vulnerability was no longer exploitable. They first addressed the issues by fixing the over-permissive regular expression, but a few days after that, they also disabled the cross-tenant network access, meaning that both of our exploit primitives were basic, basically gone. 
And they were so appreciative of, of our work that they actually awarded us with a $40,000 of bounty. <laughs> with that, I want to invite Shir back to stage to walk you through some very interesting takeaways. So we discovered those vulnerabilities and we start reporting those uh, to Microsoft and uh, Google. And we try to understand what was the root cause of those issues. We learned that Postgres SQL was not built to be a multi-tenant managed service. It was built, like I think it was around 25 years ago, and it has a very simple permission model. You can be a super user where you can do everything. You can uh, delete files, write files, loading shared libraries, execute code, a lot of operations that are dangerous and could risk the underlying compute, or you can be a low-privileged user. And this is a very simple um, permission model, but it does not fit the cloud need. Cloud providers cannot provide their customers the ability to feel like they are administrators in their own database, but at the same time to not risking the underlying uh, compute. And this is why all CSPs we worked with modified the process SQL. And they all did it the same. They wanted to provide um, users admin capabilities, but at the same time to do a lot of hardenings in order to protect the process SQL instance and not allowing customers to execute code or to risk the instance. They did it using extensions, sometimes with configurations, and sometimes with code changes. So they actually maintained their own fork of Postgres. And the thing about that is that when they do this modification, when they introduce new capabilities, it's very easy to introduce vulnerabilities. Open source projects, basically, I mean, mostly Postgres, you need to have a very good understanding of the, pro of the project before you change it. And Postgres is a very big and very complex project. So at that moment, we understood that the vulnerabilities we discovered might work on other uh, vendors. And it was a very problem, it was problematic for us because we really wanted to talk about these issues. We wanted to write a blog post about it. We wanted to go and come here to Black Hat and present it to you. But how can we discuss those issues after they were fixed in Google and um, in Microsoft with the knowing that those issues could actually affect other vendors, other managed process SQL uh, vendors? So that brought us to the question, how do we inform all those vendors? Um, so first, we initially report the vulnerabilities to Google and Microsoft, but then we crafted the report and we sent it to dozens of vendors that could pot potentially be vulnerable. Uh, we also worked with a lot of them on uh, understanding the vulnerabilities, the mitigations. Uh, we also initiated a private group with all major CSPs to collaborate on those issues and to understand like how can we solve this issue once for all and not uh, not just like keeping it more. Uh, just keeping the problem uh, bigger because the absurd part is that most vendors, in order to fix the vulnerabilities we disclosed, they just added more hardenings, more code changes, more modification to the Postgres project. And this is not good for security. This is the opposite of what we wanted to do. It's actually, they are just adding more potential attack surface for new vulnerabilities. Um, and we think um, the solution, actually this is something that we talked about the group, it's a Google initiative, to suggest, Google suggested to contribute their hardenings, their, um, uh, their own hardenings to the Postgres SQL project, the official one. So the official project will maintain um, these hardenings and new capabilities for cloud providers or whoever wanted to offer customers a bit more uh, privileges um, than just a regular user, but still not a super user. Um, so they actually wrote it on the mailing list. They offered their uh, hardenings. Uh, the PostgreSQL community uh, really debates on that. Uh, it, right now, it doesn't look that good, and it looks like the PostgreSQL official project will not embrace this. Um, if you would like to follow it, you can do it uh, with uh, the, um, you can check the mailing list. Uh, it's a bitly link, but uh, trust me, it's the mailing list. Um, a nice, uh, very good project also brought by Ivan. Ivan is a managed, uh, managed uh, database uh, vendor. And they offered, they actually open sourced their own PostgreSQL hardenings. And this is actually a very good approach because 
<laughs> because right now, um, if someone will find a new vulnerability, like the ones we found in those hardenings, it is all will be in one central place, um, it will get a CVE, uh, people could fix it in one place for all, and we think it's a very good approach. And uh, for last, I would like to talk about a different topic, which is isolation. And why isolation is so important? Uh, in the cloud, isolation is king. Isolation is the best way to actually stop hackers um, after they were able to get a foothold within the internal environment. Um, we, stayed, we started with the examples we showed today that where we had network access to other customers' instances and the isolation was not perfect, we actually had the opportunity, the attack surface, to find a second vulnerability. And where the isolation is really, really good, you can find yourself empty-handed. Now, the thing about isolation is that cloud providers have a lot of managed services. Every service is designed differently. It has different architecture and a different uh, isolation mechanisms. And we, as customers, it's, it's a bit frustrating for us as cloud customers that we have no idea how our data is isolated in each of each service. Now, cloud providers does share some information regarding their isolation. You can check it in their documentation. Usually it will be for their main compute service and sometimes for serverless functions and the shared compute container services, places where they tell you like straightforward, you are going to execute your code or your, the, the service is going to use shared compute. These are the places where usually customers are more concerned and they share information, but they must share much more information. They don't share enough. Now, during our research, when we disclose cross-tenant vulnerabilities to cloud providers, we ask them a lot of questions. And we will, would like to encourage you or cloud customers who are a bit worried or they want to understand how the data is isolated in the cloud to take a proactive approach and ask your provider. So this is usually the questions we ask when we do responsible disclosure with vendors. For example, uh, you can ask your cloud provider if they use shared compute in a specific service you use. Or, um, I mean, shared compute is very risky because they are actually using the same operating system um, to run jobs and works workers of separate or different customers. Um, so if someone will find a vulnerability in that service, it will be very straightforward to access the data of other customers. Also, a very good question is to ask the cloud provider uh, if they use containers as a security barrier for certain services. Because containers usually could be escaped, sometimes pretty easily with configuration issues. But also, even if the container was very well configured, a Linux kernel vulnerability usually break out of it. So you don't want a Linux kernel vulnerability to be the security barrier between one customer to another customer. A third question would be, uh, do, you, uh, do, they use, uh, do the customers get the same compute instance within a shared network? And if so, do they have network access? Because imagine if we would ask this question, uh, Microsoft, a long ago, um, about the Azure Process SQL Flexible Server, those questions will, it's not just to satisfy the customers, they also need, in order to answer you, they will need to do their homework. They will need to go and check and verify the service and understand if, like, how does it work there? And if you will ask this question, could it, it could be that they will fix it. Like, I mean, they will go, check, see that there is network access, they will think to themselves, hmm, that bad, they will fix it, and then we will not be here today presenting cross-standard vulnerabilities. So, um, thank you very much. It was the uh, Shirin Nir from Wiz.